We'll get started in two minutes. Media on the line, please press one to ask a question and be added to the queue. Good afternoon, I'm Mandy Cohen. I'm the Secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services, and with me today is Director Mike Sprayberry. I wanna thank Karen Magoon and Nicole Fox for doing our American Sign Language uh, Interpretation today, and wanna to flag that today is National Interpreta Interpreter Appreciation Day. Um, so I want to thank Karen and Nicole and all of our ASL interpreters who work so hard every day. Thank you. Um, they're also working behind the scenes are our Spanish uh, translators, Jackie and Jasmine Metevier. So I'll start with a rundown of our numbers and then get into some additional uh, information. As of this morning, there were 12,758 laboratory confirmed cases in 99 counties. 516 people are currently hospitalized, and sadly, there have been 477 deaths. Yesterday, we shared that we are on track to slowly ease restrictions and move into phase one on Friday evening. That's great news. Governor Cooper has signed a modified stay-at-home order. Staying home is still the best way to continue to slow the spread of the virus, protect our families and our neighbors. At the same time, we know we cannot stay in our homes indefinitely. So in phase one, any retail business may open at 50% capacity. Businesses will be required to practice social distancing, perform frequent cleanings, provide, provide hand sanitizer when available, screen workers for symptoms, and take other measures to protect employees and consumers. Once we're in phase one, people may leave their home to go to any business that is open. We continue to encourage teleworking for business that can practice it. And certain businesses do remain closed during phase one. Those include bars, personal care businesses, entertainment venues, and gyms. Restaurants can continue to serve customers for drive-through and takeout delivery. Since last evening, I've received a number of questions as to why more businesses aren't included in this first phase. So let me break that down a bit more. Given the nature of the virus, given that it's highly contagious and it can be very dangerous for some, we wanted to approach these easing of restrictions in a measured way. We wanted to start with lower risk activities, where you're largely walking around if you're indoors and where it's easier to social distance. In two weeks, when we reassess where we are on our trends and hopefully are able to move into phase two, 
we can layer on these higher risk activities where, you're, where you may not be able to social distance um, if, or sit, uh, or you might not be able to social distance or you're gonna have to sit down for a more prolonged period of time, such as a salon where you're in close proximity or a restaurant where you're seated. Those activities will always still have risks and we will need to do all the things to, that we're talking about now to keep the spread of the virus low when we address those additional activities. I also wanted to make a clarification from yesterday's press conference. While overnight camps are not going to be operated in phase one, we haven't yet made a decision about what overnight camps will do in phase two. We've been awaiting some national guidance from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and from the American Camp Association to determine how we're going to move forward with overnight camps and determine if they're going to open in phase two. So stay tuned for that guidance. Day camps, however, are allowed to operate in phase one as long as they follow the guidance released by the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services. The new order also recommends that people wear face uh, cloth coverings when leaving their house and may be near other people who may not be your family or not your household members. Um, we have an FAQ about face coverings on our website. I'd encourage you to go check that out. By covering your face when you go out for your uh, essential reasons or for commerce, you're being a good neighbor and a good community member by using those face coverings. Face coverings, remember though, are not a replacement for the other evidence-based me me evidence -based measures, such as waiting six feet apart and washing your hands and remaining home whenever possible. We have to do those in coordination. And we can't talk about face coverings and not acknowledge that some populations may feel increased anxiety and fear of bias and being profiled wearing face coverings in public spaces. If someone is the target of ethnic or racial intimidation as a result of following the recommendations to wear face coverings, I strongly encourage that it was reported to law enforcement or another government entity. For now, we still want you to stay home and if you're sick, if you're sick, you should definitely stay home. If you do go out, remember your three W's, wear, wait, wash. Wearing a face covering, as we talked about, wait six feet apart from other people, washing your hands often, wear, wait, wash. You can make a difference to protect your family and your neighbors. Let's keep looking out for one another and staying home to save lives. I thank you for that. Now I'll turn it over to Director Mike Sprayberry. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Good afternoon. Today is day 58 of the State Emergency Operations Center's COVID-19 response. The mission to support the food supply chain continues. 83 counties now have appointed feeding coordinators, and we thank them for that. 178 soldiers and airmen from the North Carolina National Guard are supporting food banks, and 98 guardsmen are supporting school districts. The Food Supply Chain Work Group is meeting daily and is working to fill feeding gaps and to support the food system. You can also help make sure people are fed with a donation to a local food bank. Visit feedingthecarolinas.org to find a food bank near you, or you can donate online. Our logistics and sourcing teams continue to purchase, receive, and distribute personal protective equipment and other supplies. Yesterday, the teams delivered supplies to 57 counties and one health care preparedness coalition. Thank you to our National Guard and Civil Air Patrol partners who are making many of these deliveries every day and as I sit here today. This is day four of Hurricane Preparedness Week. Today's focus is on insurance. Having flood insurance is one of the best things you can do to protect yourself and recover faster after a hurricane or flood. It's also good to check your homeowner's insurance coverage and make sure it's sufficient to cover your needs now before you are impacted by an event. This is also the time to check your family emergency kit 
and make sure it's ready for hurricane season. If you don't have a kit, visit readync.org to find out how to assemble one. Don't forget to add wipes, hand sanitizer, and face masks that will help you keep healthy during this pandemic. Communications with family and friends is important as well. Talk with your family about your emergency plan. It will need to look a little different during the pandemic. Make a plan that does not rely on going to a shelter. Staying with family or friends or at a hotel may be better options this year. We know that response and recovery will look a lot different this year, and communications is going to be vital. If you live inland, offer to let family or friends near the coast evacuate to your home. With COVID-19 in mind, we are all going to have to think differently to stay safe this hurricane season. Thank you for your efforts to follow the governor's instructions to stay home, stay distanced, and stop the spread. Keep up the good work. Remember to wear, wait, and wash. Wear a cloth face covering, wait six feet apart, and wash your hands often or use sanitizer. That's wear, wait, and wash. This is what will help us to continue to move through our established phases of easing restrictions and protecting our vulnerable populations. As always, don't forget to look out for your family, friends, and neighbors, and to call your loved ones daily. Guaranteed they'll appreciate it. With kindness and cooperation, we will all get through this together as one team, one mission, and one family. Thank you so much, and I'll now turn it back over to Dr. Cohen for questions and answers. Ma'am, you have the floor. Great. Thank you, Director. And I think your one mission, uh, one family is more important than ever as we think about the easing of restrictions and moving through them uh, as, as quickly as we can. That's going to get us through fighting COVID-19 together. So with that, we'll turn over to your questions. Our first question today is from Joe Fisher with WRAL-TV. Good afternoon, this is Joe Fisher with WREL. Uh, my question is about food processing plants throughout the state. Today we found out that uh, the number of cases has uh, more than doubled in the last week. There's nearly 1,000 cases now. Um, that's almost as many cases that are in jails and could potentially surpass the number of infections uh, that we've seen in nursing homes. And in many cases, workers who we have spoken with at these plants do not know how severe the situation is because they say employers are not relaying comprehensive numbers and of course the state at this point has not released information about specific facilities so um, my question is do you all plan to confirm the names of these food processing facilities and the number of cases so that the public can uh, try to get a better handle on the outbreaks in their communities Joe, thanks for that question. As you know, the food processing plants in our state are critical to us keeping up our food supply, not just here in North Carolina, but around the country and around the world. The president has already taken action to keep those food processing plants uh, activated. And we have done a lot of work uh, to uh, make sure that the workers in those plants are protected and that we are keeping those plants open. As you know, this is an industry that is heavily regulated well before COVID-19. It's regulated by the Department of Agriculture. Um, they continue to be the regulatory body here. From the public health standpoint, we have been offering our assistance to make sure that these organizations are doing everything they can to protect their workers and to slow spread of the virus, both at uh, at, in, their, uh, in their plant. So we've been working to provide technical assistance on things like um, using uh, face coverings or masks, putting up barriers, um, or doing other ways of deep cleaning. And, and again, um, good measures that will help prevent the uh, spread of the virus. But this, these are plants that need to continue to run. It is not possible to always do the social distancing. And again, how do we put in place the kinds of things that are necessary so they can keep operating? That's been our primary focus. Um, we've also been working to make sure that their workers can get tested, either bringing testing on site or somewhere close Close by. The difference between plants, uh, though, and some of our congregate 
facilities is obviously co people come to the plant to work and then they go back home to their communities where where they live and obviously the virus can can uh, be transmitted in either place. They could pick it up at the plant, but they can also pick it up in their community. So it is a different uh, uh, setting. These are also private business organizations, as you well know. Um, so we are uh, working closely to provide them, as we will to many businesses. We'll provide help and technical assistance to make sure they're able to protect their workers, their customers, and to follow our guidance um, as best as possible as we go forward. Thank you. Next question is from Stephanie santos Dazi at WLOS-TV, Asheville. Yes, hi, Dr. Cohen, this is Stephanie santos Dazi. I'm here in Asheville in Buncombe County, considering we're a very popular tourist destination. There's been some debate over how tourists will be phased back in. From a medical perspective, do you think it's safe to allow visitors in from outside states into North Carolina right away? Thanks, Stephanie, for that question about travel. And it's, it's a hard one. And I think that we are looking for guidance uh, from the federal government on some of those travel uh, implications. As I think about what we want to do here in, as we move to phase one and ease restrictions, I think there's a lot of good advice that we can, he we can heed no matter where we are in North Carolina or if we happen to be traveling in or out of North Carolina. Right, so we want to be making sure that we are covering our face if we are in close proximity to others, if we're going to be with other people, if you're going to be indoors, even if it's at a, a business that's not consumer facing, we'd ask for you to wear face coverings, um, to wash your hands, of course, and to be six feet apart. Um, so as I think through how do we ease restrictions and as we think about uh, folks traveling, those are the kinds of things that we're going to want to keep up no matter uh, what, what, we're, what we're doing or what phase that we're in. So as we work with different industries to think about how they can protect their consumers as well as their employees, those are going to be central tenants. And then we want to work with individual uh, organizations and entities in the business community on, on what are those things that we should be recommending as standardized across the board that everyone should be doing. Um, many businesses are already doing those things, um, and thank you for that. Um, and that's what we want to make sure that we're codifying in our recommendations as we go forward. Some of those come from the CDC. Others need specificity to here in North Carolina. Um, but there's a number of things that are, are tourist related right now that folks can do. For example, short term rentals or hotels. Those are, are open. Those are businesses that folks are able to uh, participate in uh, as we go into phase one. And they ha hotels have been open uh, uh, during even the stay at home order. Uh, so again, wanting them to focus on those good uh, hygiene activities that are going to keep both their customers and their employees safe as we go forward. It's going to be the same tried and true things that we'll always come back to. Uh, I don't want to sound boring, but they're, they're so basic, but they're so important and, and fundamental. But thanks for the question, Stephanie. Our next question is from Liz Schlemmer with North Carolina Public Radio. Hi, this is Liz Schlemmer from WUNC. Dr. Cohen, you mentioned uh, summer camps. Along those lines, what about youth summer sports? The Dixie Youth Baseball League has said that it hopes to have um, regular season play this summer. What do you think the guidance may be by summertime for outdoor sports? Thanks, Liz. So we gave guidance around day camps that is currently on our website. So we were saying that day camps can move forward with some restrictions, and one of them was around sports. So we said we needed to limit sports activities where, where kids would not be able to social distance. So there are certain sports that fully fo uh, you know, end up in that category, something like basketball, where you just can't play basketball and socially distance, as opposed to something like tennis or golf or swimming, where you can be social distance. I think baseball, we were having that conversation with some of the, uh, the, the leagues right now. How to, could they do that in a, in a socially distant way? I think we'd have to talk that through. So stay tuned for some additional guidance that we're trying to work through with some of these entities. I know everyone's trying to protect the kids. Uh, the coaches, the families, 
Um, I do think that as we are thinking about any sporting event, the the idea of lots of people coming around to to uh, be shoulder to shoulder to watch those events, I think we know that that is not going to be uh, something that is going to be safe, cer certainly in the short term. So we are thinking about ways how could sports and people continue to get exercise and practice um, and and continue to participate in them while still protecting themselves from uh, uh, COVID-19 and protecting all of our communities, right? Because it's not just about not having the virus spread amongst, amongst kids, but it's really about our whole community. So stay tuned for more uh, guidance there on, uh, on sports, but we have given some preliminary guidance, at least to day camps, about what sport events, uh, sporting they could do within a day camp setting. Thanks. Our next question is from Elizabeth Ann Brown with the Asheville Citizen Times. Hey, Dr. Cohen, this is Elizabeth Ann Brown from the Asheville Citizen Times newspaper. Uh, my question is, is kind of two parts. Um, why are gatherings for the purpose of worship not subject to the mass gatherings prohibition? And what is the justification for raising the maximum attendance of funerals to 50? As you've pointed out rightly before, the coronavirus doesn't acknowledge county boundaries or make exceptions for human dignity. So why, why are there such differing um, requirements for those versus other um, mass gatherings? Sure. Thanks, Elizabeth, for that question. And um, so I will say that the way we've been trying to approach the phases of this uh, easing of restrictions is to think about activities that can be lower risk at first. Right, so the things you see in the phase one activity tend to be the things that are are either when you are able to walk around, um, like in a retail establishment, or if you are uh, gathering and to be stationary, sitting or standing for a longer period of time, for it to be outdoors. So we wanted to start with the easing of restrictions in a way that allowed us to acclimate to the new three W's and these new activities that we're gonna do. We wanted to acclimate to things that were um, lower risk at first. And again, it's only two weeks of time that we hope to continue to be in a phase one, see this stability, do these lower risk activities. And so then as we move to phase two, when you get to some of these higher risk activities, we know anytime you're gonna sit down and be uh, more sedentary, you just have more risk of uh, transmitting the virus because that the guidelines are uh, pr prolonged exposure, right? That is what uh, drives the science here. Um, and we know indoors is more risky than outdoors. So we try to really uh, focus this to protect people's constitutional rights to worship, to protest. We wanted to make sure people had the opportunity to do that. They certainly can outdoors, socially distant. That is low risk, great. Um, we wanted to, again, start with lower risk activities in phase one. And then just two weeks from now, assuming all of our metrics are uh, continuing to trend in the right direction, we can move to some of those higher risk activities, but that's where we have to be particularly good about the three W's as we go into those uh, activities. So I think we're just trying to phase, phase our way uh, into some of this work. Thank you. Next question is from Jonas Pope with the Raleigh News and Observer. So this is uh, Jonas Pope with the Raleigh in and out. I have two questions. Uh, first is related to will DHS, DHHS release the number of people affected at the uh, meat processing and poultry plants and also which plants in which counties have been tested positive. And uh, my second question is related to sports. In the fall, do you see where there would be college and pro football sports, um, even without fans and stands? Great. Thank you. So on our meat processing plants, as I said before, this is an area that's highly regulated by the Department of Agriculture. We've been doing our assistance to make sure that they are um, complying with our infection control protocols. Currently, um, we do not have additional information about that on our website. In terms of sports, uh, you know, again, I think we need to see how we move through these phases. I know a lot of the perspective professional sports uh, organizations are currently trying to assess what are the things that they need to do in order to keep their athletes uh, protected, their coaching and other staff protected, and then think about the fans that come to see things in person. Um, I do think that this 
virus is going to be with us. I think we know that. We don't have a cure. We don't have a vaccine. Um, we, we know this virus is going to be with us um, until, the, until that time. And so I think that we're going to have to modify how we think about enjoying sports going forward. I think there are ways to do that. Certain sports lend themselves to moving forward probably more quickly. Uh, as we've talked about, I know NASCAR, for example, is going to be moving forward without fans uh, in the stand, but still allowing those of us at home to enjoy watching NASCAR on TV. Uh, there are other sports, like I mentioned, tennis and others, where there's not um, as much, there's always physical distance between athletes. So I think each type of sport's going to have to do that evaluation. We, we will be happy to participate in conversations for folks that are here in North Carolina, and we'll be certainly looking to uh, national guidance from the CDC and others as we go forward. Thank you. Next question is from Andrea Blanford at ABC 11. Hi, Dr. Cohen. It's Andrea Blansford with ABC 11. Um, this time of year, especially, people are just trying to make plans more than a couple of weeks out, you know, weddings, festivals, and the like. Uh, can you just tell us when the state will ease restrictions on the number of people who can gather, um, say, 100 or 200 people just to be in one place? Or can you say right now that there is just a certain gathering limit that would only be acceptable when we have a vaccine? Thank you. Thanks, Andrea, for that. And, it, and it's unfortunately a question I can't answer yet. I think we are still looking at, at information and data, certainly taking guidance from the federal government, wanting to look at what's happening around the world in other countries um, to make some of those assessments. Now, you know, look, we're going to base that information on as much of the data and the science that we possibly can. We know that when, when there are more people in close proximity, those, that's a high risk uh, situation. We want to be able to continue to have situations where if, if a larger number of people are coming together, that they can space themselves out, right? So 100 people in a 10,000 person arena is a very different uh, scenario than 100 people in a small, uh, a small venue for only you know, 200 people, right? So there's a lot of permutations here in terms of how many people to the relative size. So we're trying to work through that. We, and look, we all want to get back to the things that we love and enjoy. Um, but it, what we know there's going to ne need to be modifications while the virus is with us. So that I can tell you for sure. There'll have to be modifications. The question is how, how large will those modifications need to be to protect folks? And we want to make sure that we are protecting folks. We want to make sure that we are saving lives, that we are slowing the spread of the virus, that we don't have too many people get sick at the same time. And we've done such hard work all over the last number of months to get us to this point where we're able to move forward. And so we want to use the best science and data we have available and then make good judgment, right? As I said, it's not just about the sheer number of people, it's also the space that they're in and are they able to social distance? So those are the things we'll work through. We'll continue to get input from business leaders, from our faith community and others um, as we work through this. I, I wish there were easy, clear answers but we'll try to work through this together. I know at the end of the day, they're going to come back to the three W's, which you're going to get sick of hearing me saying, but wash, wear, wait is going to be core, I think, to how we can get back to those activities uh, that, that we all love. Thanks. Next, next question is from Claire Donnelly with WFAE Radio in Charlotte. Hi, Claire Donnelly from WFAE. Um, I know that the state is working on a 100 county testing plan. I just wondered if you could talk about what that plan entails and when it would be implemented. Thanks, Claire. So we've already been working to ramp up our testing efforts across North Carolina. Um, we, but we know that we need to do more and we wanna have that testing access be in all of our counties in different ways. And different counties have different resources. Some have hospitals that have laboratory testing right right in their uh, community. Others have FQHCs that are, are terrific. Others have a Walmart or a, War a Walgreens that may be a place where there's drive-through testing. 
So it's going to look different in each county, and we're just putting together parameters and plans to help guide our local health departments and other, other partners on how can they best mobilize the resources they have within their own counties and figure out what's the best planning for them. We want to give them guidance, but I think this is going to be about drawing upon the best resources of uh, different parts of the state, so there's no one-size-fits-all. And we need a lot of partners in this. Um, I'm really appreciative of our big commercial lab partners, the LabCorp, Quest, Mako, and others who have been uh, helping do a lot of ramp up of, of testing work, have allowed us to already deploy mobile testing uh, teams. Uh, Atrium Hospital, for example, is already deploying mobile testing teams into some of their underserved communities. So it's going to take tons of different partners with different tactics, and that's a good thing. We want lots of different ways for folks to be able to access testing. If someone is symptomatic right now, if you're watching this and you're like, I have a cough, I have a fever, I think I might have COVID, please call your doctor or your local health department or your local uh, federally qualified health center and get tested. The testing is available. Um, and so we want everyone with symptoms to get tested. And if you've been exposed to someone with COVID-19, we want you to get tested as well. So this is about also having the testing accessible, but also making sure folks know that, that we want them to to go get a test if they're having symptoms or if they've been exposed to COVID-19. Thanks for that. Our final question today will be from Kate Martin with Carolina Public Press. Hi, Dr. Cohen. This is Kate Martin from Carolina Public Press. I actually have two questions, if you don't mind. First, there's restaurants in Texas that are forbidding their employees from wearing face coverings at work or while they're serving customers. What is North Carolina's stance on what employers require of workers who are trying to protect their safety and that of customers? Also, I'd like to follow up on the NNO reporter's question on the food processing plants. You had said that information is not currently on the website on the number of infections and the locations of those plants. Does your department have that information? And if so, why won't you put it on the website? Well, Kate, let me talk about the restaurants first. So in terms of wearing face coverings overall, it is something that we are highly, highly encouraging, but we are not requiring. There are going to be certain circumstances when, when people have either breathing problems or other circumstances where we're wearing a face mask, uh, face covering might not be appropriate for that one individual. However, it is highly, highly encouraged um, for folks to do that. Um, and so uh, I, I hope that there's not going to be anyone that forbids uh, the, the, the wearing of masks. There may be reasons not to wear that for an individual person, but overwhelmingly uh, folks in our communities should be wearing uh, uh, face coverings as they, as they go forward. Uh, but it is not required, just highly, highly recommended uh, as we go forward. Um, and I think as far as, as the restaurants, I think this is one of the things where um, you know, it's not just about the governor saying, yes, this business is open or it's closed. It, it was speaking to what he was trying to communicate yesterday, which was we also have to make sure that our that customers feel safe going back to these these locations, restaurants or, or others. And so I think that uh, demonstrating as a business that you're doing as much as you can to protect your employees as well as. Uh, protect your patrons, I think is going to be the, the way many, many businesses will want to uh, proceed forward and that will help consumers want to go back to those. And I think it's part and parcel of how we go to reignite the community, the, uh, the economy here. All right, so let me get back to food processing plants um, and sort of our, our role uh, here has really been in a technical assistance role to help them comply with infection control um, and to bring testing close to there. Obviously, it's an industry that's been highly regulated by the agricultural department. Um, as I looked around, um, we, we had been starting to get these questions the other day. As I look around to other states in terms of displaying these kinds of information, I could only find one other state uh, that, that had that kind of information. Uh, but I hear you. Everyone is uh, wants more and more information. And so uh, stay tuned for, for more information about that. All right. Thanks so much and really appreciate again you guys tuning in. I think this is an important week to communicate some really important guidance to the people of North Carolina. So thank you to the press for helping us do that great communication. 
because these are so important. We have to pull together as a state, um, and, and the press is such an important component of doing that. So I thank you. I know you guys are working hard um, to communicate out these important messages so we can all uh, move forward together uh, uh, through this COVID-19. So thank you uh, to, the, to the folks in the press, and thank you for out there who, uh, who have been staying home to save lives, and remember your three Ws. All right, have a good afternoon. This was a special report from WCNC Charlotte.